Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to each of you. Thank you for joining the SOTA webinar, Tooth Whitening and Aesthetic Industry with Dr. Mark Bowes. We really appreciate um, your time tonight. Just a few housekeeping rules. Please refrain from using the raised hand, but type your comments and questions in the Q&A tab. The CPD certificates will be loaded to the SOTA platform and you'll be able to access all your certificates under your member profile. If you are not a SADA member, you'll be able to create a profile for yourself and access your CPD certificates. The event for tonight qualifies for one clinical CEU. We are streaming live on YouTube also in case you have difficulty, difficulty to access the Zoom platform. Um, Dr. Mark Powers does not um, require any introduction, but before we hand over to him, just a short introduction to Henry Schein Dental Warehouse. Uh, Henry Schein... Um, became, or Dental Warehouse became Henry Shine on the 1st of Feb 2020. Um, we recently launched um, equipment sales uh, as of April of 2020. The Henry Shine brand seal of excellence guarantees 100% money back guarantee uh, based on the quality of our products. Our online shop has recently been revamped and is now called um, by many of our customers the Amazon of dentistry in South Africa. Um, just a few quick facts with regards to white dental beauty. White dental beauty, uh, whitening product is not tested on animals. It's vegan friendly. It's got a 24 month plus shelf life, can be stored at room temperature. And we offer our customers bespoke labeling. Dr. Mark, we really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Right, let's get started. Uh, thank you so much for that. I have to say, I didn't realize about the uh, uh, animal cruelty and vegan. Is that right? Yeah, that's a big thing in our practice. You know, we've focused certainly um, in the last year on really trying to reduce carbon footprint, focusing on these elements. So this really makes me excited. I thought I knew everything about white dental beauty, but you've added a few extra really um, useful things that make me excited. So um, let me share my screen. There we go. And um, thank you. We're good. We can see it. Yeah, we're good. It's perfect. All good. Thank you, doctor. All good, man. So let me just quickly do that. Okay. I don't, I don't really need to see myself, to be honest with you. Right, so let's just go back. Um, sorry, sorry, sorry. All right. Thank you so much um, to Sada, first of all, for, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you to Dental White Beauty and uh, Henry Schein for, for asking me um, to, 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 to be that person to speak about my experience um, on the product. Um, I have to uh, put my hand up and say that um, I have been paid uh, for this lecture. Um, so thank you so much to to, Daniel, um, to, to Henry Shine for that. Uh, it wasn't a large amount, but it was a, a payment. Um, and so I would like to just point out the one really important fact. Um, and I think that those of you who have been to any course of mine will have heard me say this. There is no company who can pay me enough money to use their product in my practice on my patients unless I think it is the best product for our practice at Enamel. So although I've been paid for this, we use this product because in my opinion, um, really it is the best product for us and and as i say we focus on on really premium dental uh, care and so um as i say although there's a slight conflict of interest um this is something we do incorporate um in our practice purely because um in my opinion it is the best product um, to get the best results so i'm going to talk about tooth whitening and i'm going to talk about how i integrate that into my part of dentistry, which as a lot of you know, is, is aesthetic restorative dentistry. Um, and um, I'm going to give you a little bit of insight into both the whitening product 
and the restorative side of dentistry. So um, I hope you enjoy the lecture. The first part uh, is really about um, my exposure, my, 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 my time that I've spent using the product. Uh, I think it's now about four years that I've been using White Dental Beauty. So I have quite a, a lot of, of um, experience with it. Um, but I think that for all of us, in dentistry, we, we really have got to a point where we realize tooth whitening, um, which has been with us for, I think now more than 25 years, uh, is, is really one of the most requested dental treatments um, um, from our patients. And that if we look at this um, article, um, what we're finding is that tooth whitening certainly hasn't reached its peak, it's on the rise and that um, you know, the markets expect in the US, the whitening product uh, size of the market to be worth 7.4 billion by 2024, um, which is quite extraordinary um, amount of money. So, you know, definitely it's one of the, the most popular um, forms of aesthetic treatment that we provided in enamel dentistry. Um, and certainly without it, yeah, I think that we, we would really, um, kind of compromise always the end results of, of the cases that we, 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 we do. So I think actually I, I, I would change this. I mean, we, we try not to um, really get involved in bleaching with patients really below the age of 20, although I have to say um, I've definitely done cases for, for patients um, probably over the age of 16. I'm, I'm really not keen on getting into to patients younger than that. But certainly we have patients well over 50 um, <laughs> inquiring about tooth whitening. Um, more often actually than how, you know, the health of their teeth, which is something I think as a profession, we also need to focus on, you know, that, that it's not all about how we, how we look. It's also about really the overall health of, 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 of ourselves and, and, and our mouths that, um, um, is super important. Why do we do tooth whitening? Well, I think the, some of the answers are really obvious. You know, I think the world is driven by image, um, the likes of Facebook, social media, Instagram, um, has, has driven the self-conscious, self-image um, um, image that we, we really are trying to put out the best version of ourselves. Um, and of course, you know, youth is something that um, we, we're all looking for. And there's no question that, you know, a brighter, wider smile definitely makes us younger. Um, Self-confidence. I did a lecture this weekend about smile design. And, and really, we spent the weekend talking about not creating a perfect smile, but creating a smile that gives our patients confidence. Because really, I think as a dentist, this is the biggest gift, in my opinion, apart from providing health, um, providing confidence to our patients is something that is really something that, that is so important. Um, and certainly, you know, the word perfection and confidence are completely two different things when it comes to aesthetic dentistry to me. We, we really try to provide confidence for our patients and stay clear of perfection. Simple is more, I'll get onto that. Less is more. Again, I have a beautiful saying to my patients um, when they're looking for aesthetic uh, um, results or outcomes, um, I tell them, and it's so powerful, I tell them I'm gonna do the least amount of dentistry, but give them the best result when it comes to aesthetics. And I think that in all honesty, there, there is no other way than giving someone the best result with the least amount of dentistry than tooth whitening. Um, there's a lot of research and I wished I could play a TED talk. Um, and certainly there's an amazing talk, a TED talk on the power of the smile. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try and somehow get the, the if you just go into YouTube, TED talk, Power of the Smile. Uh, it's a 10 minute uh, talk by this gentleman who's not a dentist, but he goes through all of the important um, benefits of, of that uh, 
smile, that positive smile and the opportunities that arise um, from, from giving our patients this confidence and of course, career opportunities, happiness, um, friendships, um, and of course, as they say, media influence. So I think there's many aspects that we can be gained from really improving the smile and really starting off with just the color of our teeth in all honesty. So, you know, what, what causes teeth to discolor? And I think it's, it's clear that we can divide it into to two problems. And the first is extrinsic stains. And we all get these. They're located on the surface of the teeth, um, mainly due to things like uh, um, red wine, smoking, tea. Um, these surface stains really can be cleaned off uh, extremely easy by hygienists um, and so and toothbrushing. And so, you know, these are not reasons that we, we need to use tooth whitening. The intrinsic stains, however, or the intrinsic discoloration um, is really the reason that we need tooth whitening because we need to change the color of the tooth internally rather than on the surface. So, you know, what are those reasons for intrinsic discoloration? Well, pre-eruptive, so we divide them into pre-eruptive in terms of, you know, problems that have arisen before the tooth erupts and problems that have arisen, arisen post-eruption uh, of the teeth. And the pre-eruptive problems include uh, hematological diseases, liver diseases, diseases of enamel and dentine, uh, amelogenesis, dentinogenesis imperfecta, um, and certainly probably the most common two that we know and see in our daily uh, clinical practices, tetracycline, other antibiotics, so tetracycline staining, um, and excess fluoride, fluorosis stains. The post-eruptive um, um, ones that we, we see um, frequently, obviously trauma, you know, when teeth become non-vital, um, pulp hemorrhagic products seep into the dentine and cause um, discoloration of the tooth. Uh, primary and secondary uh, caries. Um, we all know that, that when we remove caries, we, we get uh, discolored dentine. Uh, tooth wear, again, exposure of the dentine to external substances causes it to discolor. Uh, dental restorative materials, um, I've worked long enough to see the effect of amalgam restorations on teeth. Um, it's an aging process um, that we see chemicals, antibiotics, minocycline, common one, treat, uh, used to treat um, acne um, and um, enamel hyperplasia from trauma or, or, or infection. So those are the general reasons that we're gonna look towards um, using a whitening system, a tooth whitening system, which is going to work more internally than um, something that's going to work on the surface, um, which would have been um, dealt with by polishing with our hygienists or, or our, ourselves. So if we look at the, the possibilities of managing discolored teeth, we have options. So of course, the first option that I give every patient for every dental problem is no treatment. And, and I'm not saying that this is um, the, the best treatment, but we have to, to obviously give this option. Um, most of the patients are coming to us for treatment. So, you know, it is possible to leave these teeth. Nothing from a health point of view for most of those discoloration issues um, are, are going to be um, causing uh, any effect down the line. Removal of surface stain, we've covered this. Um, hygienist mostly or ourselves in a polishing technique. I have to say that I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak out maybe a little bit controversially, but I've always been slightly opposed to the toothpastes um, that have been available to remove surface stains because all of the research I've read, of the, read about them is that they're slightly more abrasive. Um, and I think that if they're used long term, they have the possibility of um, causing some damage to, to, to the enamel. So I would stay clear of 
these these toothpastes um and i would encourage our patients to really either come to us or to our hygienists periodically depending on on how frequent that stain um, develops um, and then obviously we have bleaching techniques which is why we're here tonight um, and and what we're going to talk about um, for the next uh, 45 minutes um, and then of course operative techniques as a restorative dentist we have the possibility of 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 of, of overlaying um, masking the color of the tooth with either resin veneers or crowns tooth whitening paste as i've talked about peroxide so the tooth whitening options toothpaste i've talked a little bit about. i i really don't recommend those unfortunately don't have a lot of experience but as i say the research um, that i've read is not promising Uh, peroxide's tooth bleaching changed our practice you know as i say it's changed the way um, we can treat our, our patients air polishing so air abrasion we have polishing systems micro abrasion um, depending on the depth of the discoloration um, again composite restorations and por uh, porcelain uh, restorations which we're not going to spend too much time on this evening so for those of you who don't know much about um, how the process works, um, we all know that um, basically the uh, chemical that we use to bleach teeth is hydrogen peroxide. Um, and for peroxide, hydrogen peroxide to work, it needs to be in an alkaline uh, pH. So I'm sure that all of us having done dentistry know that anything from seven below is acid um, and above seven up to 14 is alkaline so in order for hydrogen peroxide to start bleaching teeth it needs to be in an alkaline environment or in an alkaline form the problem about hydrogen peroxide is that it is only stable in an acidic environment. So in other words, when we store our bleach, when we get our bleach, it's in a pH less than seven. And that peroxide has to actually move from an acidic um, uh, to an alkaline state before it starts to actually have any effect on whitening the teeth. The peroxide, um, as we all know, is the bleaching compound. Uh, the, 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 the action of the peroxide is influenced on, as I've already said, the, the pH. Um, and we need to somehow get the pH into, or the peroxide into an alkaline environment um, where, although it's unstable, in other words, you, it, doesn't, it doesn't store in an, al in an alkaline uh, environment, it starts to bleach the teeth. Um, it breaks down into what's called a peroxide, a per hydroxyl ion. So once the hydrogen peroxide becomes alkaline, it changes into a per hydroxyl ion. And this uh, per hydroxyl ion is respons responsible for the bleaching by breaking down um, large stained molecules into a smaller uh, colorless molecules. So current whitening products, hydrogen peroxide, carbamide peroxide. Um, you know, the, the stability of these in the shelf life is good if they, as I've already said, is if the pH is less than seven, um, but essentially we need to wait for these to become more than seven to become alkaline before they start to bleach. So what's different really about um, white dental beauty and what really attracted me um, to the product was, um, this unique um, formula which it has which they call Novon which I believe is exclusively yes patent it has a patent and and really what it does is it enhances the whitening process by accelerating um, the transfer of the hydrogen peroxide from an acidic pH to an alkaline pH you know, and I think that that as a product, certainly in enamel, um, you know, our, our patients are really looking for for the best products 
um, to really build practices. And I think, you know, this for one, for sure, when you see the packaging and when we get to the branding is certainly something that, that, that fits in with kind of the enamel um, uh, name. And so, yeah, I think an, another big thing, and I'll get round to the, the, the acidity and alkaline issue in a little while. But the other thing that I'm really attracted to with white dental beauty um, is the storage. Because as we know, um, certainly in the past, all of the other, and, and there, there are obviously many dental um, or whitening products on, on the market. But I must say that every other one that I've used over the nearly 30 years that I've been whitening teeth have all been needed to be uh, stored in the uh, fridge. So they need to be kept cool. And I have to be say that I'm as guilty as I'm sure all of our patients coming home with a tube of bleach and leaving it um, outside of the uh, fridge and leaving it in the bathroom. And so, you know, obviously, you know, with the product, if it's, you know, we're told to keep it, to keep it um, in a fridge um, and we, we allow it to, to be kept at room temperature, for sure that's gonna have some effect on um, how that uh, really bleaches the teeth. So the storage with white dental beauty is great. You can store it at room temperature. There is no need to store these bleaches in the fridge. And I think this is a great help for us in our practices and a great help for our patients um, at home. So we've been through this. I want to show you what really happens is that again, the per hydroxyl iron, um, when, it's, when the, the hydrogen peroxide reaches an alkaline pH, as I've said, it breaks down to the per hydroxyl iron, hydroxyl iron, and which then attacks these large molecules, breaking them down into smaller molecules um, which um, are, are, are much lighter and colorless. And the, the tooth basically change from that darker tooth to a lighter tooth. So that's really a, a very basic overview of the bleaching process. Um, but what's really um, important is the slide, is that the time that it takes. So if we look at most um, bleachers, what happens is we put them in the trays in an, in an acidic um, uh, form and then over a period of time in the mouth it turns into an alkaline state. The reason that white dental beauty uh, is in my opinion superior for my patients is that this process this change from acidic to alkaline happens rapidly as we can see um, from this picture on the on, on the right and so the and this is due to the novon uh, molecule or the novon content in the whitening gel so this means that the the whitening procedure starts to happen pretty much immediately that the bleaching material in the tray is put in the mouth versus other options where there's a delay because the the the, the bleaching products have to turn uh, into this alkaline state before they start working Whereas in dental white beauty, this happens instantly. So in other words, if a patient wears a tray for two hours, you're gonna have a, a much more effective two hours with white dental beauty than, than any other possible one because the alkaline, um, uh, um, the alkaline, it reaches its alkaline state immediately rather than waiting maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes before it starts working. So. Instead of two hours for an alternative type, you might only get um, 40 minutes, uh, 60 minutes, 80 minutes. I'm, I'm not quite sure. So yeah, that's, that's a, a, a big difference of, 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 of the two. And that's really why I like it. Um, and really what that really means as well um, is that it, it, it enhances the bleaching process, but it also allows us to start to think that we can use a lesser bleach, in other words, a weaker bleach for the same amount of time. So if we took, and I'm gonna go on to one of the biggest problems in a minute of sensitivity, but we can take a, a lesser percentage bleach. Um, so if we went 15% of an alternative brand 
one can use a 10% in white dental beauty because in that two hour period, it's gonna be more effective for the two hours um, because it immediately reaches that pH that we were talking about. So for those of you who don't know, I think we should all understand the mathematics of, 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 of whitening and whether we're talking about carbamide peroxide or hydrogen peroxide. Um, just to, to fill anyone, everyone in, because I think it's amazing that still today, I mean, I think there are some of us who don't realize the, the difference in strength, but 10%, if we're using 10% carbamide peroxide, it's equivalent to 3% hydrogen peroxide. If we're using, um, it's about a third. So 16% carbamide, 5% hydrogen peroxide. So it's about a third. Hydrogen peroxide is about a third um, of the carbamide peroxide, just to, to, to give you some understanding of, of strengths and, and, and the two differences between carbamide and hydrogen peroxide. But yeah, I think that for all of us who have been, been doing bleaching long enough, without question, the biggest problem is sensitivity, you know, that there are a bunch of patients who, who most definitely um, really are, are turned away from tooth whitening because of the sensitivity that it creates. Um, and the research will tell us that it's as high as 50 to 70% of patients who undergo tooth whitening experience sensitivity. Um, some of them extreme and some of them to the point that it's not possible to, to use even a 10%. So again, another thing that I really like um, about, about white dental beauty and, 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 and you know, um, it's, it's something again, I just wanna say it again, that, that we choose to use these products in our practice because I honestly believe they're the best for our patients like composites, like ceramics, like adhesive materials, like impression material, everything that we choose, I choose because I think it's gonna give me and my patients the best result. So I really, really like um, White Dental Beauty because it is the only company that, that has a 5% um, option of uh, uh, carbamide peroxide. So whereas all the others, you know, the lowest number is 10%. And for a lot of patients, 10% creates a lot of sensitivity. So they introduced um, a milder version. It's 5% uh, carbamide peroxide. Um, and because of the ability of the 5% formula to reach the alkaline state instantly. If we use 10, if we use 5% for two hours in a tray, it has the same effect as 10% on another type of bleaching gel that doesn't have this ability to convert into the alkaline state immediately. In other words, that there's a delayed process and during that delayed process, no bleaching is going on. So the, the research that's come out shows that, and I think it was done at the Eastman Dental Hospital, I might have it here. They found that if you used 5% carbamide peroxide for two hours, it gave the same results as 10% carbamide peroxide um, in other types of um, whitening systems that didn't have this ability to, to instantly change the, the pH. So I think for all the sense for all our patients who have any sensitivity, um, our go-to product is, is a 5% carbamide peroxide. And, and when they're using 5%, they almost have zero sensitivity. So it's, it's allowed us really to offer tooth whitening to, to, to every patient who previously um, had a problem. Right. So how long will it take? You know, wh what is the time our patients and, and today we're obviously talking only about home bleaching, tray bleaching. We're not talking about in-chair bleaching um, because these products are not for in-chair bleaching. Um, I'll give you, as when you get into the restorative side of the dentistry, I'll give you my opinion on home bleaching um, and what I really feel about it. But, you know, for normal discoloration and for normal improvements, um, we, we're going to provide our patients with um, enough gel for one to two weeks. And in a one to two week period, 
um, we achieve the desired results of, of the patients. And I'm talking about generally, because we know that there's some patients um, who want ridiculously white teeth. And, and I, I think, you know, we're, we're talking for the average patient now um, who wants to see a, an improvement that they feel has given them the confidence that they were looking for in improving their smile. Um, yeah, no, no stains and no um, um, pigments. Yeah, then, then no whitening because we need other types of ways of, uh, of, of fixing their teeth. Um, tetracycline stains, we, we know are going to take a long time. These are very stubborn. Um, we're going to go to a, a, a weaker bleach, so 10% or 5%, depending on sensitivity. And these patients are going to have to bleach for between two um, and, and, and six months. So, um, you know, and, and they might have to go for two days on, two days off, depending on sensitivity. But it's really going to take a fairly long time for tetracycline uh, stains um, to change or fluorosis um, patients to, to, to really change the tooth color. So we, we prepare them, they understand this, um, and, and it's really, they're, they're in for the long haul. So I've talked really about the key elements of, of why I prefer, why I like white dental breeding, and I'll just sum that up quickly. Um, the first is that it's stored at room temperature. And I think that's a key element because I, I really honestly believe that I would, I would guess as many as 20, 30, or even 40% of patients in the past, in my past, and certainly I was one of them, um, took bleach home and, and really left it in, in, in my bathroom. We didn't put it in the fridge. So I think this is a key element. Issue number two is that it works quicker because of the Novon, because of reaching an alkaline state, immediately it hits the mouth, it starts bleaching. There is no delay for this process to happen where um, it sits in the mouth, changing from pH from acid to, to alkaline. So that I love. Um, and the third thing I love about it is obviously it gives us the 5% carbamide peroxide because so many patients complain about sensitivity. And so, Really, it just opens up a whole new area of, of tooth whitening in our practice where, where patients were really just dead against it because they'd had one really bad experience and, and now um, they have absolutely no issues and, and their maintenance is, is really simple um, because of the 5% working pretty much the same as 10% um, of, of, of alternative brands. That, that's been my experience. But really, I think, you know, if we're talking about home bleaching, the thing that changed everything for me was understanding, you know, how to, to make a bleaching tray. Because for the vast majority of the time that, that I've been using home bleaching as, as really one of my most, and it probably is, well, it is, I'll, I'll say it now, my favorite way to, to, to whiten teeth um, is, is home bleaching and not chair bleaching. Um, I think I feel we get a more sustainable long-term result. I feel I'm more in control of the desired end result that we need. In other words, we can add on a little bit. We can stop if the teeth are getting too white. Uh, I am more control in, in, in the process. But the key element to the success of home bleaching is the tray. And for so many years, we used these trays. We were taught to put um, reservoirs in the front of teeth and then to cut the, the tray into a scallop around the gingival margin. Um, and in my opinion, all that did is it wasted bleach and the bleach ended up in the mouth and the effect for our patients was a lot less than uh, the system that we're gonna, I'm gonna show you now in terms of how we, we, we customize our, our, our bleaching trays. So I'm gonna play a little video for you. Please take note of this. It's probably the most important part of this bleaching lecture that I'm going to give this evening. So what we do is we don't throw away all your old excavators. Keep them. Uh, we do all of our, our trays in-house and we use the excavator to basically create a small scallop around the gingival margin, as you see in here. 
So we, and the upside is it's removing all those nasty bubbles. We then do a normal traditional suck down. And then the key thing is where we cut. We now cut a straight line about three or four millimeters below the gingival margin. So no scallops, no scallops. It, this is much more comfortable for the, for the patient. The tray is much more stable. It's the same thickness material. And the key element to this, and I'm just going to go back um, and you can see the tray. The key element, and I'm just going to stop this here. The key element is, is what this really does is when we do the suck down, it's creating positive pressure at the gingival margin. So it's creating a seal all the way around. So that when we put, and now we only need a small amount of bleach. So when we put the bleach inside the tray, because of this positive pressure here, there's no way that that bleach can escape onto the soft tissue, burn the tissue into the mouth. It stays on the tooth. And, you know, along with the, 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 the immediate alkaline transformation, the results that we get from this tray formation probably improved home bleaching, in my opinion, in our practice by 30 or 40 percent. So, you know, this is the way you need to do it. Your patients will feel way more comfortable. The trays will last longer. And yeah, you, you, you honestly, it will, it will change your lives because it's far easier to make the trays like that uh, as well. So let's jump in. We've got 20 minutes um, left. Let's jump into some clinical cases. That's enough of talking about white dental beauty. Um, I want to now bring tooth whitening into restorative dentistry. And so I, the first slide, and I thought really the most appropriate way to talk about this, and I apologize about my voice. I have to say that um, um, I don't have corona, thank goodness. Um, I ran a two-day course, and I spoke for two days, so I have a little bit of a laryngitis. Um, so I hope you're all hearing me okay that side. So what do we mean by shade guide? You know, and certainly what I mean by shade guide when it comes to tooth whitening, I don't mean a Vita shade guide. I mean, what is, what is the shade? What is the ultimate shade we're trying to aim for um, that relates to the age of the patient? And, and where do I think is the ideal shade, you know, that we should be working? And now we're talking about not just bleaching, we're talking about restorative dentistry. So in other words, if I'm doing 10 veneers, how do I feel that if I'm given the option to choose the shade for the patient? And of course, this discussion is a discussion between the two of us, but where do I feel comfortable um, when it comes to deciding you know, what shade each patient gets? And of course, that really depends a lot on the patient, but I think more importantly, the age of the patient. So in my practice, BL1 and BL2, I, I, I never use them. Again, never say never, because I have to say that my arm has been twisted. And I think in all honesty, over the last decade, I've probably done one or maybe two BL1 or two cases. I, I just think that they look fake. They look artificial um, and, and really I try to push my patients towards more natural, more smiles that are more in harmony, that make them look youthful um, rather than unnatural. So I really try not to go towards BL1, BL2 um, as a restorative shade and I'm talking more about porcelain now, um, but I know that there are a lot of patients who, who really push us towards this um, but I really, after a good discussion, I think I can manage to, to convince them that this is not maybe in their interest. BL3 is definitely for selective patients. There are a lot of patients. These are the younger patients who can pull off B, BL3 where, where really it looks good. But again, you know, I think we have to be careful in using BL3 because for a lot of patients, again, it's just too light and, and really you start to to, to get teeth that look unnatural. 
So BL4 is one of my favorite shades. And certainly when I talk about young patients, I'm talking about young adults. Um, you know, what does that mean? Probably from anything from late teens to kind of mid forties, late forties, you know, these days, maybe even fifties. You know, I think younger patients have become younger and mature patients have become younger. So, you know, BL4 is, a, is one of my favorite shades um, that, I, that I, I try to work a lot with because I see the outcomes for the patients are great. Um, A1 for mature patients who are really looking for a youthful smile um, and A2 for older patients who really want a more natural look. Um, I'm not talking about single teeth. Of course, if you do single teeth restorations, these might end up darker than A4. So that's my kind of thought process about where I feel I, I would like to end up with patients and the guidance I give them as to, to what's going to look good for them. Already I've told you, do the least amount of dentistry to give your patients the best results. And if it's possible just to do whitening and achieve that, that's my go-to. Because if we're talking about conservative uh, procedures, um, uh, procedures in aesthetic dentistry, whitening starts off with, at the top, then orthodontics, then resin uh, restorations, then veneers and crowns. So again, you know, whitening is, is really the first thing um, that we look to. And again, you know, just whitening makes an amazing difference. Here we went from A2 to BL3. Um, this was a tray case. And I believe it took about between two and three weeks. And this is a big change. Again, um, what I found with, with um, these sorts of difficult cases where we do have inter warn all my patients, I warn all my patients about the possibility that after whitening, we still see might see some discrepancy, um, but can, you can see with that polarized picture that we managed to deal with that um, really nicely. These are um, cases where if we can't achieve it, it might be that it's a microabrasion case that that surface can be polished off um, before the whitening takes place. So I think it's prudent to warn patients that it might you, that they might still have some effect of that brown stain. Um, after. But let's really get into the restorative side of dentistry, um, because again, this is what I do most of in the practice. Um, and I would say pretty much, unless I'm doing a full mouth rehabilitation, um, I try to do the least amount of ceramic work, um, but give the patients the best aesthetic outcome, which means that most of my restorative cases will incorporate whitening. So most of, in fact, Pretty much every case we do will incorporate some form of whitening. So here was a case with missing laterals that we did. We started at A2. Um, we did some um, we did some home uh, whitening with the trays that we've talked about. We got to BL3. This took three weeks. Um, really nice color. Again, this sort of patient, young patient, can pull off BL3. BL3. Um, I, as I say, we'll be able to, I, I have a big problem with when we're basically combining, and I'll show you a case in a minute, where we're combining BL2 with, with restorative work. And I'll explain why. So BL3 and now some restorative work. The big question is, and, and if you look at the research, as I say, it's, it's really, there's a lot of confusing information about um, the effect of tooth whitening on the adhesive uh, processes in restorative dentistry. In other words, can we whiten and bond immediately? If you look at the research, basically what they tell you is that we need to wait, but the time varies from three days to, to, to three weeks. Most of it is around a week to two weeks. Um, and as if you had to choose a week to two weeks, in our practice, we wait one week. That's, that's the, the kind of go-to time between the finishing of the bleaching. Again, also just to allow the tooth color to stabilize, but also to get rid of any effect that might uh, cause a problem in the bond strength or interfere with the bonding um, protocols of, of whatever adhesive, whether we're doing veneers 
um, or resin. So we wait one week um, in our practice between the finish of the bleaching to the um, to the bonding. And in this case, we did some some resin bonding, BL3, uh, and I think that the outcome for the patient was was great. So one of the most popular parts of, of restorative dentistry in, in I think uh, the world today has become the aligned bleach and bond or the light trend dentistry protocol, because we all know that most adults have problems with alignment. Um, our teeth get more crowded as we get older. Our teeth get darker as we older. So what are the solutions really to align the teeth, to bleach the teeth? And of course, all of us wear our teeth because and sadly, we're not given night guards when we should be given in our 20s. So the three most common problems in, in adult dentistry is that our teeth um, change position. In other words, they, they move as we get older, they discolor as we get older, and they wear down as we get older. So, you know, the opposite to that is we align them, we bleach them, and we bond them. So here's a simple case, A1 uh, to, a, to A1 to BL3. This was 10% carbamide peroxide uh, in 10 days. And so with our line bleach and, and bond cases, what's interesting is we actually use the final uh, aligner or retainer to do all the bleaching. And in all honesty, it works just as well because I think that the fitting surface is so good at the gingival margin. So we don't even make them a, a, an extra tray we make them trays for maintenance. They use their retainers at the end of the, the, the orthodontic to do all their tooth whitening in. Um, here was a case that started at A1. Here we chose to align the teeth with fixed orthodontics. Um, we did some bonding, as you can see. And again, orthodontics, seven months. This is probably the most powerful aesthetic protocol that, that we have because it's completely non-invasive. Um, you know, the, the orthodontics can often be quite simple. Um, the bleaching obviously is, is, is really predictable. Um, and obviously the bonding is non-invasive. So 10% carbamide peroxide, 14 days. Align, bleach, and bond. It's without doubt, you know, the most common aesthetic procedure that we provide um, our patients. Yeah, and, and kind of turn your patients into fans. You know, what I, we talk about is that our patients walk out singing our praises and building our business. So, you know, if your patient walks like out like that, they, they are going to be the best advertisement um, that money can buy if you want to build a, a dental practice. So here's a good case of why not to bleach beyond a BL3. It's a young ch chap came to see me. He was A1. He had a reverse smile curve. You can see he was a class three. He had some issues with his front teeth. Actually, one of them was non-vital. We went through the whole DSD. I won't complicate that. We went through the whole DSD protocol um, and we did four veneers. But he was determined to get to BL2. Now, the problem with pushing a patient into BL2 and combining natural teeth with ceramic as we all know, as the patient gets older, the ceramic will stay BL2. This is a big issue because the ceramic stays BL2, but the patient's teeth discolor. And now he has a huge maintenance problem. And in fact, he came back to me and he said, you know, Mark, I should have listened to you. I should have not bleached my teeth too much because I cannot manage to maintain this tooth color you know he's, he's having to bleach them pretty much every month um, until in all honesty we we change those anterior ceramics and we give him something like bl4 in which case his maintenance will become manageable so be careful when you're combining restorative dentistry with natural teeth <coughs> and pushing them too light because again i found it with with patients the maintenance is is impossible they start to get recession after a few years, it becomes sensitive um, and, and, and most likely they end up having to um, re replace the ceramic restorations. And in this case, um, you can see that actually he came back five years later, you can see that he's done a pretty good job 
at keeping the color, but you, you're starting to see the issues developing. Um, and certainly within the next, the next three or four years, yeah, the, those ceramic restorations will, will probably need replacement purely from a color point of view, not from a structural or health point of view. He sadly lost a tooth with the endo with a, with, um, because of uh, a root canal failure and fracture. Um, but with my good friend, Dr. Howard Gluckman, um, we can go back and end up with uh, results like this. So be careful with BL2. Um, I think it's too light and you run the risks. The ultimate challenge, you know, these are cases where patients are looking for um, really uh, uh, um, a high end aesthetic result. This case started with A4. Yes, we can do a full mouth rehab, but the patient really had a budget problem. We obviously needed to replace all the upper crowns. I've already alluded to the fact this was a mature patient and understand that form is more important than color. So in these patients, and we're not going to do anything to a lower tooth other than basically replace restorations and maybe some resin, um, we have to be realistic about what is it that the, the final color we can achieve on the upper ceramics. And so I've already said that my go-to color is A2. Um, these were the lower, the upper restorations um, finalized. Um, and now the lows obviously were, 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 were a bigger problem for me than, than, than providing these ceram beautiful ceramic restorations because we had to work with what, what was there. And so we ended up, I think, bleaching them with some resin restorations. We managed to get it to about 8.2.5. 8 um, in my opinion, I'm happy that as long as there's only a half shade difference between the upper and the lower teeth, um, it's not going to complicate the aesthetic outcome. Obviously, what you can't do is have a patient with, with bleached four at the top and A2 at the bottom, um, because obviously this is clearly going to compromise um, the outcome. So half a shade is for me okay. Um, you can see the A2 really works well for the sort of patient, but more importantly, I think that, um, yeah, we turn our patients into fans and build our businesses. And so, you know, for me, um, anything, A2 would have been too light because I wouldn't have managed to, to, to control the color of the lower teeth. And I think in all honesty, you know, A2 for a patient like this um, is, is the, right, the right color. So again, another restorative case, we ended up um, coming in to fix, she wanted to fix her front two teeth. Um, she started as an A2. You know me, I love DSD, it's my thing. We did DSD and we realized that she needed to fix four teeth. Um, again, here, yeah, we're going to push the, the boundary. We're going to really educate the patient about maintenance. So it's a conversation I have with every patient before we start a veneer case. I talk to them about um, the color that they would like. And then I have a long discussion about maintenance, about what maintenance they're going to need in order to, to keep the ceramic restorations the same color as the, the tooth restorations. So here we went from A2 to BL4. That's my limit. And I think in a patient like this, I, for me, I think BL4 uh, is my favorite shade. Uh, I do more BL4 um, reconstructions, whether it's full mouth reconstructions or partial um, you know, restorative cases like this, where we did four veneers and natural teeth and, and blend them together. The bleaching is predictable. You know, they look really natural. They look really youthful. Um, and so, again, this is a personal thing. There's no right or wrong. Um, but for me, the bleaching is simple. You can see we went to 10% carbon mite peroxide, 14 days, and we just do two hours a day. Our patients don't need to sleep with bleaching trays. They just do two hours because remember what I said, within that two hours, we get a two hour window of bleaching. It's not like we put a tray in and we have to wait half an hour before it starts. So for that full two hours while that tray is in the mouth, uh, it's, a, it, it's going through the whitening process. So yeah, our, our patients are wearing their trays only for two hours. 
and really it's all about aesthetics and blending ceramic restorations with natural teeth you know rather than just putting ceramic on every tooth which sadly i see a lot of in dentistry today i think this is the last case we're coming up for an hour um, again, a young patient started with an A2. He had some old restorations. Um, and, and really, again, you'll know that this is a case that I'm going to do the least amount of dentistry. Um, I'm going to give him the best result. Uh, and again, we, we're going to aim to go for, for BL4. Um, I prefer not to, to put veneers on cases like this, especially with these canines, because there's nothing wrong with the canines. And so... I'm going to combine ceramic restorations, resin restorations, and tooth whitening um, in a case. This is my one of my most favorite um, cases to do. Uh, again, we go through the DST. I'm not sure to talk about DST. You can see um, that he needed to lengthen his teeth. He had some small diastomas to close, um, but the canines needed to change shape um, because they were a little bit pointy and it wasn't going to integrate um, the smile curve. So we went through the mock-up. The mock-up looks great. I always try to use the same color that we're going to end up with ceramics in the mock-up so the patient gets an idea of where we're going. So you'll see um, this is a bleach color, and the bleach color is very close to BL4. Um, A1, we went from A2 A in this case to BL4. Preparation, guided preparation, beautiful ceramic restorations, all done digitally. Um, you know, isolation, beautiful fit. Uh, I wish I could spend lots of time on this case. Uh, we fitted the veneers. You can see this is BL4. We're matching composite just to close that small embrasure between the canine and the, and the lateral. Um, but we're not going to cover completely uh, the, um, the canine. So that was after the whitening before the ceramic, and that was the, the, the end result. So some of my favorite materials, again, we use them because I believe they're the best for my patients. We use single shade monolithic materials, Evanes single shade composite bleach color, um, Emacs monolithic restorations, BL4, um, and dent white, dental white beauty. Um, but the reality is, you know, I think this is what it's all about. Yeah, it's a beautiful color. The maintenance is, is really simple for the patient. Um, we don't burden him with having to, 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 to whiten his teeth every two weeks for the next 15 years, 20 years, because I can promise you when I do veneers and I understand bonding, I understand enamel, my veneers are going to last 20 years. And, and really that patient's not going to, especially if we've got to be able to, they are not going to be able to bleach their teeth um, and keep them that color. So again, it's something that um, I'll skip that. So that, that little video, actually, um, what I was, I'll go back and play it. I don't think you can hear uh, the uh, sound, but... So I believe that video didn't have sound when we tested it out. And, and, I, and the guy said, no, just play it and just talk over it. But I wanted to just actually include it because what I love about, this is the fourth thing, by the way, and I'm, I'm, I'm about to finish one minute over. What I really love about White Dental Beauty, which is the fourth thing. So let me go through them again. Room storage. You don't need to keep it in the fridge. Number two. Novon, which means that it converts carbamide peroxide, hydrogen peroxide, into an alkaline state immediately. So the, the whitening process starts as soon as that tray goes in the mouth. Four, three, sorry, three, five percent. We now have a massive bunch of patients that we can bleach their teeth because they've been turned off uh, tooth whitening because of the sensitive sensitivity issues. Four, branding, packaging. At our clinic, we're big on brand, and I think it's something every dental practice should be focusing on. You know, remember, 
that, that, that no longer are patients patients, our patients are consumers, and they love to see and get treated in a special way. So when they walk out of that practice with that beautiful blue bag, they really feel like they've been elevated, that they're getting something really special, which in my opinion, they really are. So there's some Facebook and, and Instagram. Um, uh, um, if you'd like to follow me, if you don't, that's also okay. I don't mind. I won't take it personally. But thank you again to Sada, to Henry Shine, Dental White Beauty, for giving me this opportunity uh, to, to give you my experience of, of tooth whitening, the importance of tooth whitening, how I fit tooth whitening into our restorative practice, and some guidelines as to, to what I feel the best marriage is between these two important elements when we're treating uh, our, our, our patients. So I thank you for that. I'll stop sharing my screen. I hope you all enjoyed that. My voice is still here. And uh, there we go. Thank you, Dr. Mark. Really Thanks appreciate it. Uh, very informative um, uh, presentation. Thank you so much. It's all right. We've got um, a few minutes left for Q&A. Um, and if you don't mind, I'll read the questions. And then no uh, you can answer them. Hi, I'm Mark. How would you compare the clinical results between microabrasion and whitening procedures? Yeah, so microabrasion, I think, is, is, is one of those things that, that falls kind of in between intrinsic and extrinsic stains. So in other words, there, there are times, so fluorosis is probably one of the most common, where, um, where the, the staining is, is not completely on the surface. In other words, like red wine, tobacco, and all the things we identify that can be polished off but it's not in the dentine. So in other words, the stain is in the surface of the enamel. And so we, we know, and we, we've used certain acidic, we can use certain abrasive elements uh, to, to create um, um, uh, where we polish off the surface layer. How many microns we're polishing off, I'm not sure. Um, it's something that I used to, to do more of, um, but I suppose I'm not sure. I see less of it in my practice, but it's, it's one of those things that's, that fits kind of in between uh, whitening of teeth where the problem is really internally in the tooth and polishing of the teeth where it's on the surface of the tooth. So in other words, the procedure is to remove uh, I, probably 30 or 40 or 50 microns of the tooth with an abrasive polish um, and to see if the stain is removed. So, but I would be careful at the end of the day, if you don't remove that stain, you might then need to contemplate a restorative procedure. In other words, removing it with um, a, con a conventional process, which we all know, you know, high-speed diamonds, local anesthetic and, and a, a resin filling, yeah. Thank you, doctor. Um, next question. Have you tried the KORR bleaching products? And I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. And what impressions do you take um, to make what types of impressions? So I haven't tried CORE. And, and you know, I'm not here to say that this is, this is uh, the, the, the best product because I haven't tried every bleaching product. Um, I've tried a lot of bleaching products over my, my, my time as a dentist, as you all know, I've been here a long time. Um, and, you know, it's like ceramic restorations, you know, that, and it's like a lot of things. If, if, if I find a product that really works well in my hands, you know, I, I really am reluctant to change because I see no need. And so, again, the results that I've, I've had with White Dental Beauty um, are so predictable um, that, um, yeah, I've, I've not been exposed to core, core products. Uh, and, you know, so I, I can't really comment on that. Uh, as far as the trays go, it's one of the few times I still take uh, analog impressions in my practice is to make a bleaching tray. 
So otherwise, every other impression is done digitally. So um, yeah, just alginate. That's all you need. You know, straight alginate impression, but cast it straight away. You know, don't let those impressions lie on the surface. Straight alginate impression, cast it straight away. And, and then that trick about using the excavator to, to, to create that scallop, and that creates a, a pressure of the tray on the tissue, which locks the, the gel onto the tooth. It doesn't allow it to reach the soft tissue. Mm -hmm. And that's a key element of this lecture. If you, if, you, if you don't take away any other thing, then I love to use white dental beauty. It's how to make a bleaching tray, in all honesty. And, and by, by all means, if you want, send me a personal message. I'll send that, I'll put that, I'll put that video out on the Implant Aesthetic Academy link. I'll put it out so that you can, I'll put it on my own Facebook page and Instagram page so that you can see it again if you missed it. Thank you, Doctor. Prof. C.S. Grobler found opalescence to be non-damaging. Uh, we've been using it for years with amazing results. Apart from Novon being a quicker and less sensitive product, why should, should we switch? And then there's a pricing um, question that we're unable to answer. Okay. So I, I think the, the reason I switched, and I'm not going to mention, you know, who I switched from because I don't think that's relevant, you know, in this, in this lecture. Um, I don't want to mention any other names. The reason that I switched um, was, was for two really big reasons. The fir first, and at the beginning, to be honest with you, I, I was still finding out about this alkaline, uh, the acid to alkaline and, and how much faster it was. But the two big reasons was because uh, patients didn't need to store it in the fridge because I think it's so often never stored in the fridge and, I, and that must have a detrimental effect on the shelf life of the bleach when it goes home and, and the outcome. And secondly, because it's the only company that allowed me to help a lot of my patients who complained about sensitivity. It was the first bleach on the market that allowed me to now include, I don't know, 30% of my practice who stayed away from tooth whitening um, because, because they experienced sensitivity. So, you know, that, that, was, that was a game changer for me in all honesty. Thank you. Beautifully answered. Thank you, doctor. Can this be used overnight? And are there benefits for extended exposure? Yeah, it, you, you, you can use it overnight, um, but there are no benefits, in all honesty. I, I mean, our experience has been that uh, two hours is, is, is the same as, as overnight. It's not going to, it's not going to, you're not going to get a better result if you leave it in for the whole night, if you're using five or 10%. Two hours is sufficient. We, I've not seen any difference, um, you know, and, and really, I think it's for patients who, who feel that they don't have two hours during the day, then by all means, they can put it in at night. Um, but don't, don't tell them if they leave it in at night, it's going to work faster, for sure. That's, that's not something I would tell them. Um, and I think most of my patients, my feedback is, you know, they, they prefer... Um, to do the two hours in all honesty than the overnight. Um, and the other reason is that all my patients wear night guards. So they're not allowed to wear bleaching <laughs> trays. <laughs> We've got a um, question we, uh, regarding the specifications of the material used for the bleaching trays, um, i.e. the thickness of the tray. Okay, so uh, I, I, I will, lie if I told you I mean it's if, if I could say that it's standard bleaching tray material thickness I, I mean that's a crap answer I know I'm so sorry but you know it's if you go to to Henry Shine or to any company and you ask them for standard bleaching tray material it's it's not thicker or thinner it's just the regular thickness the key element is that we cut it five millimeters, four or five millimeters above the gingival margin. So the tray is very stable in the mouth and the scallop keeps the bleach on the tooth. And, 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 that's the, and it's much more comfortable for the patient because if you've cut scallops and that patient puts it in, inevitably some of those scallops are sharp and they 
poke into, they do two things. They poke into the lip and all the bleach escapes. It's, it's honestly, in my opinion, a complete waste of time to cut a bleaching tray scalloped around the gingival margin. I'll, I'll be as honest as that. Thank you. Uh, what are the long-term effects of tooth whitening on the intrinsic tooth structure, the enamel, dentine, and cementum? Yeah, I, again, you know, the, I read a lot, a lot and, and there is a, a lot of very uh, confusing uh, opinions about uh, the long-term effects. Um, and I would say, again, you know, it's all about, about kind of moderation you know what is a normal amount of bleaching and you know if if someone used 20 percent every day for 10 years it's going to harm their teeth you know I, I think if we're talking about getting our patients to a realistic tooth color like bl4 and then the maintenance that they're going to need the, the 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 evidence that i read is that there is no negative effect on the long-term outcome I mean, it's the same argument, you know, that that it, you, you, if you drink too much water, you will die, <laughs> which is the truth, you know. But again, you know, I think all the research was within a reasonable amount. And what is reasonable, again, you know, how long is a piece of string? Um, in my opinion, reasonable is finishing your patients uh, in, in somewhere around BL4 and not getting them to BL2 and BL1 because then they're going to have to bleach their teeth a lot. And, and I think, yeah, I, I would be potentially concerned about long, but I can't give them any hard-term evidence um, on that. Thank you, doctor. Uh, next question is, is the average uh, number of days between 10 and 14, and how, lo how long should patients wait between treatments? So, um, yeah, I, I, when we... When we um, if we're looking to to go from um, say a, if we're looking to change two shades. So if we're going from A1 to B from A1 to BL3, A2 to BL4, then uh, and they have they have good healthy enamel. You know, I think again the, the, there are differences in age. So we all know that if a patient has good healthy enamel, the bleaching process is going to be more efficient. If it's an older patient, it's going to take a little bit longer. But if it's a healthy, a healthy enamel patient and relatively young, so what is that, 20, late teens to 50s, and the enamel is pretty good condition, we very, very rarely need more than four, uh, two weeks. Very rarely need more than two weeks. Um, we, we generally give our patients uh, enough bleach for uh, 10 days to, to two weeks. And I tell them that if they feel that they like their tooth color after 10 days to stop and rather come to me and I'll have a look because there's always a week between the finishing of the bleaching and any restorative procedure. That was that research that I showed where, where they, it varied between three days um, and, and three weeks, but most of it came out around about a week. So I, I, I think that it's safe to say that um, I would, I definitely would try and avoid or avoid going to do any adhesive procedures, any ad adhesive bonding directly after bleaching. I would wait seven days. Um, and yeah, most of our patients do the required home bleaching. I think because of the trays, in all honesty, because the trays are so efficient, I think if we were making old fashioned scallop trays, it would take twice as long. That's my opinion. Thank you, doctor. So we've got a few questions about uh, one, is there such a thing like once off bleaching? Um, how long should the trays be worn per session? And then how often should um, patients bleach? So in other words, if I get it right, uh, I think we've just about covered the first part. So in other yep. words, if a patient is starting the bleaching journey, um, and again, there's a huge variation, but let's just take the average patient, kind of, you know, middle-aged adult, starting at A2, wanting to get to BL4, you know, wanting to change one and one to one, one to two shades, because I think this is an ob a realistic objective. So first, they're going to need the two weeks that I said. They're going to need a good tray. We're going to go to our go-to 
is 10% carbon peroxide. We don't give the mild bleach unless they come back. I warn them and I say, by the way, if your teeth become sensitive, please come back and we'll exchange it for 5%. So our go-to is 10%. And we will generally, we, do, we will do two weeks. After two weeks, I would say 80 to 90% of our patients reach the desired shade. And yes, some of them will need an extra week, maybe an extra two weeks. Certainly the older patients will need longer because we know that, long, that the, the older teeth, older patients' teeth with, with thinner enamel, darker dentine, will take a longer time to, to whiten <coughs> and also get not nearly as good results. When it comes to maintenance, maintenance again, it will vary tremendously on, first of all, the color that the patient wants to uh, keep. In other words, if there's been ceramic work, then obviously they're tied into that color and that's the point I was trying to make. Um, but generally the maintenance uh, advice that we give is that they're gonna need uh, between two and three sessions every two to three months. So, you know, we, we generally say you're gonna need to do it twice. So two two hour sessions every two or three months. That's generally. And then we will help reevaluate the shades over a period of their checkups over a period of a year. Some of them might need four, some of them might need one. You know, obviously we will then customize it for that patient, but those are the guidelines that we give them. They don't need more than, than that. And, and that for, in my opinion, is, is manageable. You know, two sessions every three months uh, is really manageable. For sure. Doctor, um, a few more questions, but before we get there, there was also a compliment. Um, thank you for a very form, uh, informative um, webinar um, from one of the attendees. So thank you for that. Um, we've got several questions with regards to reservoirs um, in the bleaching trays. Uh, what's wrong with them? Um, and then the second question on that was, um, if there's no spaces needed enough, there was a question mark on that. Okay, so I stopped using reservoirs uh, about ten, seven, maybe seven or eight years ago, maybe nine years ago. I used to, for, for many, many years, for 20 odd years, I used reservoirs. And then I can't remember, um, I'd like to take the credit for designing this tray. Um, but it wasn't me. I, it was it was someone I used to work with. We sat down and we decided that there must be a better way, and 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 we decided to to go through this process. There is no question that the the end results are far. When I say not slightly better, far superior. There is no need for a reservoir, so. Unless you're a bleach company, I'm sure bleach companies love reservoirs because the, the, the patients have to put more bleach in the, in the trays. As long as you put, so they end up having to put the smallest amount in. And that smallest amount, because there's no space, space is actually in contact with the tooth. Okay, it's, it's kept in there. So Remember, this is not a, it's not completely rigid. There is space for this material to move. And so, um, yeah, I mean, and, and if you put it in the reservoir, so what does the reservoir do? It's not like a reservoir that's feeding bleach into a different, it's just sitting on top of the tooth. So most of the bleach doesn't even get in contact of the, with the tooth. So I, I, I know I've seen it uh, still uh, advised that you need to make a reservoir and you need to, 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 to create scallops. Um, but all I can say is that in our practice, um, we stopped doing this not, and we, this is not experimental anymore. We've now treated tens of thousands of patients with the, this trade of uh, um, um, protocol. And, and as I say, the, the results honestly are far superior. So um, I can't answer why it was decided a long time ago that you needed a reservoir. Um, but all I can say is that we don't use them and, and our results honestly are much better than when we had reservoirs. And we, use much less, and we use much less bleach. 
It's a win-win, except for the company. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, I'm going to combine two questions. Firstly, um, it's a question with regards to natural teeth whitening products, uh, products that contain, uh, contain a bicarb of soda. And then also, um, uh, okay, let's go with that one first. Sorry, Doc. Okay, so yeah, I, I'll be honest with you with, with that. Um, I, I, have, I have never used it. Um, and so I'm not going to say that it's great or it's not. It, I, I really, it's. I've never used it, so I think I would be. It would be unfair for me to say it was good or bad. Um, all I can say is that I know a lot of influential aesthetic dentists in the world, and 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 I value their opinions. And I don't know any one of them. Who, who uses bicarb of soda or, or any of these other products that they, they all use one form or another of hydrogen peroxide or carbon white peroxide, you know. Thank you. Um, the actual two questions that I wanted to combine. Firstly, would you advise um, patients to change their diets while bleaching? And uh, once orthodontic brackets have been removed, how long do you wait uh, before bleaching? So um, I, I, I don't really get them to change their diet, you know, because I think realistically, uh, when we stop the bleaching and they go on to maintenance, you know, you, you, you can't get them to change their diet forever. So you have to build in the bleaching process. You know, obviously, I advise patients who have a lot of staining and, and on their teeth, you know, that that you know, red wine, smoking, tea, all of these things potentially stain teeth. But, you know, it, I'm not going to limit my bleaching to patients who are prepared to change their diet because the reality, as I say, is once we've finished the restorative work, those patients are going to need to go on to maintenance and you can't expect them to keep changing their diet based on having to keep their tooth color a certain shade whatever it was we decide so i don't change i don't i don't give them any dietary advice at all zero um and the other question was to say it again uh was with regards to uh, orthodontics orthodontics yes how soon after <clears throat> so you will refer back to that case that i showed my protocol with orthodontics which is interesting which makes me think you know, again, and, and we do it, uh, it might take a little bit longer, um, but it just stops me making extra trays for the patients and reduces the cost. We remove the brackets. We, 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 we polish very carefully. Again, this is a subject that, that, that really makes me quite mad in dentistry, that um, I see so many patients' teeth that have been ruined by bracket removal. In other words, I see burr damage, I see damage to the enamel. <laughs> I know I'm off topic now, but I think it's something we all really have to focus on. You know, that, that, that when I take brackets off, high magnification and I have a very strict protocol that I don't do any damage to the enamel. As Soon as the brackets are off, we take an alginate impression. Again, that's probably the only second reason I take an alginate impression. And we make a standard orthodontic retainer. Yeah. Normal, nothing out of the ordinary. Normal orthodontic retainer thickness. I sadly can't give that number either. But we use the retainers, okay, to do the bleaching. It might take a little bit longer. But in all honesty, our, our results are also amazing. So we use the retainers to bleach the teeth. We don't actually make them a, se a separate tray. And the results we get are, 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 are really good. Sometimes we get a little bit of gingival irritation because I believe that the bleach doesn't have that seal that we get with a tray and it can seep onto the soft tissue. So that's the only downside of, of using a retainer versus a bleaching tray. Um, but we start straight away. I, I, we don't start, we don't wait for any time. We take the brackets off, we make the retainers. The patient gets the retainers 
two hours after I've taken the brackets off and they can start bleaching that that evening. Same protocol. Well, two hours, 10% carbon mite peroxide. If they have sensitivity, we switch it to 5% and we go again, two hours, they might need one extra week. They might need a few extra days, but it doesn't exclude them from the procedure. Thank you. Only uh, three more questions left. How much gel do you place in each space, tooth space, and how soon after casting the model do you scallop? So um, again, my my my, you know, I, I I hand over all of this responsibility to to my hygienist. So I work very closely with my hygienist. She knows exactly um, the the protocols that I've talked about. Um, how much do I put in? <laughs> A fraction to what I used to put in when I used to create wells. That's that's the first thing I would say. In all honesty, I'm just trying to think of an, an, an amount that uh, you know would relate to someone. It's it's really it's almost the smallest amount that the patient can see. It's so small. They they hardly need any in that. You know, I, I think that let's think about okay, like a match head. We all know how big a tip of a match head is, or so young people probably only use lighters. Or, but if you think about the size of a match head, it's about half the size of that. So you only need really a tiny little bit because that gel is going to go, there's no space for it. So it's going to find itself over the front of the tooth. Once you put reservoirs in, you have to really almost overfill the tray. I'm sorry for you. you guys. You sell less less bleach, but you know, I think you would rather have a good result and people talking about how well it worked than people telling you that it wasn't working. 100, percent doctor, we uh, fully um, are behind you on that one. It's about the results and not about the amount of bleach being used. Um, the difference in efficacy on the carbamide versus the hydrogen peroxide. I, 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 I don't think that there's, a, in my opinion, there's a difference. You know, I think each company has just different uh, um, amounts, um, I mean, percentages. I, I think really what you just have to decide is, is you know, and, and so for, for me, I don't mind. I, I, I want to use 10% carbamide peroxide. I want to use 5% carbamide peroxide. So I don't mind using 3% hydrogen peroxide. You know, I, I, I don't want to use 10% hydrogen peroxide because it's three times stronger than 10% carbamide peroxide. But I don't have a problem with using one or the other. The end result will be the same. I think we just have to understand that 10% that carbamide peroxide is not the same strength as 10% hydrogen peroxide. I think that's all we have to understand. Yeah. And last question for the evening then, uh, is bleaching safe to use um, on a 13 year uh, patient? I personally wouldn't, you know, and the reason for that is clearly that the teeth most likely haven't erupted properly. And so what you're going to bleach half the tooth and then the tooth erupts and the gingiva, you know, and then you got half the tooth bleached and, and half, you know, I think that's why I said really realistically I'm I'm going to start bleaching kind of mid-teens really and very gently you know I'm not going to be aggressive you know so the teeth have to really be in their final position in other words if orthodontics has to be finished the soft tissue has to be in the right place relevant to the CEJ um, you know you don't want to start bleaching teeth and find the soft tissue then hasn't reached its final position and then you have half the teeth ble bleached and the other half not. So, you know, I think that's a clinical decision that each dentist can make. We're taught about these things. Um, but the reality is it's going to be somewhere from middle to late teens. You know, younger than middle teens, for me, no. Thank you, Doc. There was, sorry, there was just one last question that um, creeped in. Um, how soon after casting do you scallop? And that's that for the evening. No problem, no problem. 
as soon as the model is set. <laughs> Simple, you know, as soon as it's hard. I mean, you know, how long does a model take to set? 20 minutes? Yeah, as soon, as soon as it's it's hard enough that the plaster's set, you know, mm -hmm. that, that we scallop it. We, we pour them and so, yeah, tray, we can make a bleaching tray generally in about half an hour from the time we take an alginate. It's, it's also a lot quicker to, to make a bleaching tray by just doing the scallop and cutting it straight than to create little reservoirs on every tooth and then try and cut the scallop. You know, if, if you... If you time the, the, the laboratory process, I can do it in half the time that it'll take someone to go and put uh, reservoirs on and, and cut scallops. So. Thank you very much, Dr. Lots of uh, compliments in the chat. Um, uh, thank thank you. you for great lecture. Fantastic, brilliant. Uh, Doctor is the best. Much. We love white dental beauty. Um, Thank you so much. And thank you for all the participants. Uh, really appreciate your time this evening. Uh, Dr. Mark, That's as always, kind. been fantastic. Can, can I just say one thing? I of just course. want to say hi to, hi to my good friend, Dave Altram from the UK. <laughs> <laughs> Dave has been hiding back. in the background. <laughs> ah, there he is. We go back hey, a long way. Hey, <laughs> How are you? How's it going? Yeah, yeah good. Thank you. I, I couldn't resist that. I saw your name and I had to say hello. Appreciate it. Great to see you, Mark. Thanks for the lecture. Catch yeah, up sometime. That's all right. Okay. Thanks, Take care. guys. Cheers. Thanks, Sada. Thanks, everyone. Have Thank you evening. all. Cheers.